Next, I want to talk about, um, uh, Andy's going to go uh, in a bit, but um, before we transition, I just want to uh, touch base on a couple things as we transition to starting to fly uh, uh, this week. And so uh, we have these, these small guys, um, and sometimes when they're small like this, and they might look kind of toy-like. I think sometimes we kind of tend to treat them as toys or little little things. We, we, we treat all of our units the same way. We treat, treat everything as if um, it's potentially dangerous, we're gonna take the safe procedures, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, even these little guys, they have spinning little blades, right? Now that's not gonna sever your finger probably, but you know, it could, it could, could give you a cut. If you weren't paying attention and it flicked and it hit something, it could fly and hit you in the eye or something, right? So we always treat everything with respect as if it's one of our big giant honking things with a, with a huge prop on it. A couple things to note, and this has come up a couple times with our uh, transmitters on our simulators, just to reiterate, everything takes batteries, right? And so just like the units take batteries, the, the ways that we talk with those units require some type of power or batteries. And so, um, just to reiterate, uh, some of you guys have been having problems logging on to the computers. We've got to remember to fire up the unit right when you're on the simulator and make sure it's on so we can talk. Similarly, when we're done, power those things off, right? Now that we're transitioning to start using batteries and all that kind of good stuff, you guys will need to start paying attention to, to battery consumption and all that good stuff, right? So, so we have in the prep lab, we have you know chargers and all that kind of stuff in, in good jazz. And, um, uh, if you if something is low, right? If, so if, if if you can tell the batteries are getting low on the unit or in the transmitter or whatever, um, make sure you pull those. You know, we'll go through all the steps. Make sure you you definitely pull those guys out. Sometimes it's happened. I know it's well, you'll never do this, but sometimes you're kind of like, oh yeah, I gotta go. There's a class. I'm oh, yeah, I'm oh, yeah, okay, good, and, and then go right. So we want to leave things depowered, the batteries out of them. If batteries are in the thing. The assumption should be that they're working, so you don't want to leave dead batteries that need to be charged or whatever in, in these units. That's just sort of general battery stuff. The other thing to mention is that, um, especially with these small units, as we get to, in a few weeks when we start getting to our larger units and we have these more custom batteries that are really, <clears throat> like on the Inspire or whatever, really made to, it's, you, can't, you can't screw it up, right? It kind of goes in the slot one way and it's the thing. For these smaller units though, um, it's important you guys take a look at them right before we start before we start flying. Take, in fact, let me just pass these guys. Let's pass a couple of these guys around right now. Um, just have a look. So these guys have batteries in them, in their bellies. But uh, I don't want you to connect them. But just have a look, right? So they have these, these little pin connectors. Very easy if you're not paying attention and jamming to bend those pins to to jam them in and and have them have them tweak or have them snap or whatever. So don't connect them. But you guys have a look, and I think you guys will see. Uh, that uh, you'll see that those guys um, go in one way. And just like everything else, just nice and easy, right? If you're not sure, ask a bud, ask me, like, is this the right way? And like, you know, gentle, and it should be no problem. In the case of the hub spans, they're, they're going around, but, uh, but in the case of the hub spans, so the battery is, is stuck in the belly. All of our units have the battery basically in the belly. That's going to be the center of gravity. Right, so that's, got, that's where the machine is most balanced and, and, and uh, to a degree helps with stability. Um, these guys though, you do have to push it in a little teeny bit. So, so we wanna be gentle, but um, you do have to be firm to get that battery in. We already talked about the pin connectors. Uh, and then um, while you guys have been training on our more traditional transmitters, and when we, when we start heading out and doing things that's more like the, the main stuff. Uh, these guys look a little, for the small units, for the hub stands, these are a little more cartoony, a little more uh, uh, like PlayStation-y kind of controllers, but it's the same idea. The same, the same sticks that you're getting familiar with there are, are here. Um, so uh, even though it looks, it looks funky, um, we, we treat all these transmitters the same. So before we power up any, um, now, so for, for these small units, Powering up is basically connecting the battery. For our more expensive commercial units, putting the battery in is the first part, and then there's usually a, a, a button to push or a, a switch to flick to actually tell the unit to engage the, the power systems. 
these little guys, once I plug that battery in, it's, it's potentially live, right? So the key thing to remember is we're always going to turn our transmitter on first. The, the, the thing that's communicating with our, with our mobile device, or with our flying device, we're going to turn that on first. Then once that's on, then we're going to activate the UAV. And why is that? Why do you guys think, why do you think that, that specific procedure is important to go through? Because why? Sure, but why, for, from a, this is for a safety perspective. Why do we want to turn the, the brain on first? Uh, because if it had power and then you turned off the brain, if the brain was already, if the throttle was already up, it would send a signal to that. To could be, on. could be, yeah, totally. Someone else could be on the same right. frequency. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. So if, if we go in and we have, and, and again, we're learning this procedure, is it the most dangerous thing in the world to have one of these guys spin up? No, probably not. But we're going to be following the same procedure with all of our devices. And so the idea is when we have something like, say, the Inspire, that can slice off your finger, right? Uh, if we go down there and power it up, and somebody over there has another transmitter, and, and um, I haven't, we haven't established this connection that, hey, I'm the dude in charge of you, that other aberrant signal might come in and might, might be, um, you know, not, not nefariously, but someone might accidentally fire up the, the thrust or something like that, right? And then, whoa. So that's why we always want to make sure our control device is the first thing that goes on, and then the unit is, is activated or powered up. Cool? OK. Um, today, we're going to be doing this just with these little guys just in here and pro probably maybe even go in the next room or so. So um, while we can go outside with these things, these little teeny guys, um, the first few times, let's keep it out of the wind, right? Let's just do it here in a nice, nice wind-free area. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is fine if we're just you know, one unit or so in there. With a lot of people around, better to go into another room where we're nice and clear and, and empty. Anytime we're going to do this, just like we want to check and make sure we have power and all this and that, we want to go through some pre-flight checks. Um, Todd wants to. Todd wanted to call in, so maybe before we're done, he'll he'll give his spiel on, on pre-flight checks. But basically, what what that's going to entail before we go and put any power in this thing. So it's your turn. Your it's my, my rotation. I don't care if twenty other students have gone before you, you're always going to treat this as if you just pulled it out of the shelf, right? Again, we always go through all of these uh, uh, steps. So you take this guy and just check him out. First, just take, you know, 10 seconds. Let's just take a glance at him. I haven't seen this thing before. Let's check it out. It's kind of cool. Got some LEDs. I'm, I'm looking it over, right? I'm just sort of inspecting it. Then I'm just sort of looking, is there any cracks? Is there anything that's clearly stressed or, or something of that nature, right? I'm uh, gonna feel these. Gonna make sure the, the the you know the props are able to spin, and that's that looks cool, right? And is there anything nicked up or or dished out? We have we have extra for all of our devices. We have extra. So these things commonly are the thing that if we don't land properly or we bump into a tree or something, those these are things that get nicked up and and you know a little teeny bit is not. A, and so so if you're not sure, ask Chase, ask me. Ask Dan, ask, ask any of our more uh, seasoned folks here. But you know, just a little feel with your fingers, make sure it's okay. And if it's not exactly 100% perfect, it might be okay. But if you ever have a worry, pff, no problem. Let's pull that guy off and put a replacement, replacement uh, a guy on. Um, and so it's so, okay. So, so visually, it seems okay. It looks okay. I don't see any weird wires sticking out. It looks like something's broken or something. Cool. Um, then, then um, put that guy down. Um, in the case of here, you want to make sure everybody is, is we, we've, we've, we've cleared of, of, of obstructions. Out in the field, make sure there's no power lines ahead and all that kind of stuff. Now, these things we also will have done ahead of time and checked our site. But, but nevertheless, regardless, if you've checked it before, put that guy down. Just make a little you know, visual check of the rooms. Get, get your situation, situational awareness going down. Okay, cool. Okay, there's a way to, there's a entryway over there, there's a door over there, that kind of thing, right? Sense of the space. Um, now, um, how we typically will do this once we get into the bigger units, our typical team for anyone flying is three people, okay? When we're out and about, we also have our safety vests on, but we don't have to have those on in here. 
But, um, but three people. So there's the pilot, the one that's actually doing the driving around. Uh, if there's a data capture device, there's going to be a person on that. So, so uh, in the case of the Inspire, it might be someone uh, with, a, with a, uh, a separate controller or a dual controller that's operating, articulating the camera, let's say. Okay. And, and all the pilot is doing is piloting the craft. All, all the, all the, he's not doing any data collection. I mean, he's probably going to hopefully fly in a way that's conducive to data collection, but you know, he's not going to be triggering the camera or she's not going to be triggering the camera or whatever. The data collection person, that's their task, right? They're going to, they're going to be recording, not recording, turning, spinning, whatever. Okay. And if they want to go back, they would tell the pilot, hey, we want, need to go back and get an image of that tree or something, but they're not flying. But then, importantly, there's a third person. That third person doesn't have a hand on any of the electronics, okay? That third person is simply there to spot. That person is simply there looking for what's going on, okay? So he or she is, is, is the wider eyes, right? It's very easy to get tunnel vision with these, both the pilot, because I'm, I'm watching my, my thing up there, or the, the data collector person, because they're staring down at their screen, probably. Don't know if a bird's coming from behind you, right? Don't know if, if you know, any of a gazillion possible hazards. Um, and so, so that third person is this, is this sort of broad situational awareness checking for stuff, OK? Um, we would also have someone stationed, in addition to those folks, to make sure any people walking up, we, we sort of encounter those folks and, and, and engage with those. That would be, that would be um, in, the, in these cases, we, don't, we won't really be in, in public places where the public should be coming up to us. But, but um, anytime we're in a group, we'll have at least one person that's their job is to do that. Now, in the case of the class, we're going to be taking turns, right? So we're going to start this, and somebody's going to fly for 10 minutes or whatever. Then we're going to rotate. And, but so, so you will get to do all the stuff. But when it's your turn to, say, be the pilot, that's what you're doing. When it's your turn to be the eyes in the sky and, and the, the roving eyes, that's all you're going to be doing. You're not going to be looking at the guy, not going to look at the pictures of the cool infrared data you're capturing of the coyote on the hill. You're just going to be doing that task, okay? And so, <clears throat> so start with these micro quads, though. Uh, this is a little deviation. We won't be having every single person doing all these things, right? So what we're going to have is we're going to have the pilot. And then we're going to have another spotter that's going to be there that's just going to watch and make sure everything is cool, right? So we'll, we won't have all of that, but we'll, we'll, we'll have that, that structure, though, in place. Cool? All right, great. So we'll get to that later today, but just wanted to have that brief, brief overview for, um, for all that good kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, one other quick one that we mentioned about batteries. Just um, I was mentioning that you check over the, um, uh, the unit itself. Also want to take a look at the batteries, right? So we talked about this last time, and I have that video up on YouTube. But um, so these guys, and you guys haven't used them yet, so it's it's hard for you to know. But once you once we start after a couple days or so, you'll get a sense of this. But um, these batteries here are all cool, um, and but if you just kind of feel them, they're 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 they feel like hard, right? They're 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 a thing. The problem would be. If it kind of looked like a little like middle-aged dude like me, if it was getting a little portly, a little a little big in the middle, and if we were to pinch that thing, it would it would give a little. It would, it would start to feel a little soft, um, and so so that again, that's kind of thing. Just you know, quick glance at it, kind of soft. And one of the the nice things about these particular units is if the batteries start to go, you can't physically squeeze the battery in the unit. So so kind of a unintentional bit of a fail-safe thing there, but. Um, but yeah, so that's another thing. So just like we're checking the unit, you also want to check the, uh, the batteries themselves. Cool? All right, any general questions about that stuff? Our poll's good? Yeah, Dan. Yep, just from our experience, all these manufacturers have proprietary propellers. You know they have clockwise or counterclockwise rotations. They also have different profiles. I mean, the standard profile, that you see the rounded end of the propeller. And there's one called a bulldoze, that looks like the, the end of the propeller. Right. Right. <laughs> is, um, the propeller will usually press itself down onto the shaft of the motor, start interfering with the rotation of 
motor. So go back and check that the propellers all have a tiny little gap. You press them all, make sure they all have the same gap, air gap between the propeller and the motor. Two or three motors just stop. And they'll just they'll fly the whole system. So just check it out that the same manufacturer. Yep, excellent point. And so I would say, um, and these are things you guys, so, so these guys are cheap. These things are like 30 bucks, 40 bucks, right? I mean, you can get a little bit more expensive. But um, so if you guys wanted to get one of these on your own and just start playing with the practice, that's great. Um, note though that these, as we go to the cheaper models, like Dan was saying, it, it's easy to, Amazon saying, here's some replacement propeller. It's very easy to get the parts that maybe don't go with your exact unit. So, so really good to pay extra attention to the, the make and manufacturer um, of, these, of these guys. Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, great. Just like uh, some of you guys have been interested in getting your, your own simulator so you can practice at home, awesome. Another great one. So because this is still, we're still new at this, we don't have any lab fees associated with this class. But when we do have lab fees, one of the first things we'll do is we'll probably have like a $100 lab fee, and one of that thing we'll do is buy one of these for everybody. Uh, another thing I just wanted to, uh, uh, put out there was uh, one of our collaborations. So let, let me just uh, introduce this. So this is um, one of our efforts to try to embed this technology more, uh, you know, so we're trying to make this a really truly interdisciplinary tool. So you guys, are in for, you guys are in this class from various majors and stuff. We're also trying to make sure that we're embedding this technology at the university level in more interdisciplinary ways. So one of our first uh, uh, direct outreaches is a collaboration with the art department, with the performing art department. And so we have this thing called Arts Under the Stars, which happens in May, at the end of school. So you guys may or may not have, have been to one of these. It's basically like a Friday night and it goes for, I don't know, three, four hours. And just like you guys do capstones with me, research-based capstones, the performing arts students have to do a culminating art piece, um, typically. And so they are, um, and, and, and so, and so it, this, this event, Arts Under the Stars, it's, you know, the jazz guys do a jazz song and the, the choir folks sing some song and it just sort of, you know, goes on and on and on with all these different uh, art pieces. And so uh, we were approached by the folks doing um, the dance efforts that they wanted to know if we could do, do some collaborative things. So this is still evolving. You guys do not have to do this. It's not a requirement of this class. You don't get part of your grade for doing it. But if you guys are interested, I'd love to have you help out. And so the short version is the arts, the dance students are creating a dance, and we are going to create the drone support for that. What that exactly is is evolving, but um, it will most likely be they're going to. I think they want to do a dance about water, sort of interpreting water and drought and all this kind of stuff. So they're going to maybe like a four-minute dance kind of thing. And the current thought is that we're going to have some drones be part of the dance performance. Probably as some kind of sprite or little ethereal thing. And so we're figuring that out. So if you guys want to help out with that, that'd be great. Tim is helping out. And if anybody else is interested, let us know. We're, just, <clears throat> we're going to be building the drone part of it and piloting it. Um, and so this is just to give you a sense for what we're talking about with one of our uh, performing arts professors. Things that we need to be getting working on for Arts Under the Stars. And so uh, we have two things we're working on. One would be that the drone can be surrounded by some type of concept, some type of physical thing either on top of the drone mm -hmm. or around the drone mm -hmm. with light that creates a character, turns the drone into a flying object mm -hmm. that could be a concept, an idea. Mm -hmm. um, Dealing with uh, water, change, morphology. Right, so the idea, maybe somewhat kind of like the whisk from Grave, but not quite, mm -hmm. maybe somewhere in between that, and a flowing Chinese lantern. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with the idea that people have inspiration for change in different times, that people will have ideas on their own, they're not supported, that goes back into the norm. So we have qualities of water as necessary for life and nature, you have industrial corporate requirements, you have the way things have always gone, and then you have the idea that at some point in time a breaking point arrives and what happens then. Um, okay, so one aspect is to take a we took these out of the junk pile. Right, out of our out of our 3D waste pile. 
So you have to bring, hold up. So, so, so one is the actual flying thing itself, the flying uh, uh, component. And the other is, can we cast some interesting textures and light patterns? And so we've been digging through the, um, through the our 3D uh, waste cast off bin. And what's waste to some people is creative fodder for others. Because if you shine a light through this one, and I don't have a light on my phone, right, so get I some of check pattern it. behind it. This one is a grid, it's very rigid. This one, up close, will give you some type of wavy pattern on the ground. This one gives you bars. Carrot top gives you a whole <laughs> different pattern here. Where was the one that made stories at? Uh, Oh, is there a block? Oh, okay. And filtering through, if you right. place the light in here, so you're looking at the concept of a gel filter that would go on to a theatrical light piece, but it's something that you guys can design and print. Um, so if you pass the light through here, the reflection out of it gives another reflection out. The way that the light travels through is a little bit obscure, and it would be an interesting way to change the scenery, change the stage, change the movement of motion, uh, with just the fight in and out of the room. Right, and so for my guys, what you guys task is going to be is we need to make some some examples of, of for the Trumpet production uh, students and, and other folks get a sense of what's possible. So I mean, you get their, your first task is going to be to print a couple of di different uh, sort of extreme examples of things so people can get a sense of maybe how big and, and what funky shapes and that kind of stuff. So to give you guys feedback on what in the trash bin here. Um, we talked about this one with the light in it. Different things to think about would be to change the size of the holes, mm -hmm. to maybe change your layers. So what happens if you have three layers but with larger holes? It's going to give you uh, different layers of light, different patterns through. So changing your and, and also with this, one thing that I think is a, is a nice strength, I don't know if you can see this, but we look into it, the, 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 uh, we have this sort of rough texture here, but on the inside we have this reflective one. That could be nice for reflecting light back out. So we can also think about maybe mirroring some of these surfaces to, to help uh, with the light, uh, magnify the light coming out the holes. This one is neat, but if it's too rigid in the lines, the, the, the travel through ends up looking more like you're in a bale of straw. <laughs> Cool. All right. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Art from cast off.